Hi everyone, I'm Gail Persa Kelly, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's ULTA webinar, Email Message Reputation Impact on Your Engagement Metrics. Our speaker today is Jeff Hemming, who is the Product Manager for Ticket's Marketing Solutions Portfolio. I would also like to thank Ticket for sponsoring today's webinar. Today's presentation will run about 45 to 60 minutes. Please submit all questions to the Q&A box, and if those are not answered during the presentation, they will be addressed at the end. Before we start, please know that we are recording today's webinar, and we'll post a link to our website under recordings shortly after today's presentation. I will now turn over the webinar to Jeff. Great. Thank you very much, Gail, and thank you all for uh, participating in today's webinar. Um, as Gail has mentioned, we're going to talk about email reputation and engagement metrics. Uh, under what I titled is content dead dot dot dot. So we'll have some fun I hope as we go through this. Um, also as Gail's mentioned I'm with Ticket. Um, most of you will have either seen me speak or know me through our e-marketing product uh, that integrates into interaction um, and really what that means for us on the call I've got a, a fairly deep background in um, email marketing having spent the better part of the last 15 years uh, on the topic. And what I'd like to start with is sort of a welcome screen here for us, um, sort of to kick things off. Uh, we're gonna do an overview of what email reputation is and how it impacts on our engagement. Um, that's really the core of, of what the presentation will be. Um, but sort of a, a couple of high level things as we start into it. Uh, this really is a topic that comes out of the IT side of the house. Uh, it's something that our IT teams and the, the email world will be um, familiar with or even directly involved in. Uh, and it may be an interesting one, why are we talking about an IT type function or an IT type topic um, uh, in a technology sort of marketing role. And it really has a lot to do with, as we'll see as we go through this, uh, the notion of email reputation coming forward uh, and being something that we need to be aware of from a marketing or business side perspective because of its impact on our business. Uh, and really, my outcome, other than you know being able to give you some information on the topic, uh, is hopefully to kickstart a conversation in your firm around email reputation and its mix with content and and how it impacts uh, our engagement side of things. So with that, before we get into looking at email reputation, I always like to I, well, I think it's a very fair question to ask is why are we still talking about email? Uh, it's been in the marketplace for the better part of the last 20 years. And we're certainly seeing a lot of very interesting uh, things happen in other media, other channels that we have available to us. Uh, so why is Jeff coming on about something that uh, is related to email or email reputation? Um, and these three points are really what I want to talk through for the first few minutes here. Uh, the big one and, and pretty directly related actually to the notion of email and, and what it's doing is uh, Gmail's recent announcements uh, last month, they opened up um, some new technology that they're bringing to the platform. They're going to enable uh, at media queries for designers or folks that are into responsive design. That was is and was big news. Um, but for the rest of us, really what it's pointing to is Gmail's made a fundamental change in how they present content. Um, and that, if we look at that just for that context, they're investing still in the platform. It's certainly one of the biggest platforms in the world, uh, used very heavily in the consumer world and, and even in the business world. So that a company of that size would make such a fundamental change to what they're doing, I think augurs well for what we're looking at in email. Uh, and then some numbers that I've pulled up as part of preparation for today's session. Um, E-Consultancy did a, a survey in the last year, and the, the teaser that I pulled out of it is that from their consumer base that they looked at, only 9% of the people that they uh, surveyed came back and felt that email was a redundant channel. So it may be a backwards way of coming into it, but the flip side is 91% of the people that were surveyed by e-consultancy see email as being a valid channel. So a big number or certainly a big percentage. Um, a little closer to home for us, uh, marketing Sherpa's survey from last year, uh, they ask a number of questions, but the one that I wanted to highlight as part of the email question uh, is around, they ask their business contacts how they prefer to receive communications from companies. And wonderfully for email, it came back with 72% of the respondees 
uh, were favorable to it, either favorable or very favorable. So I wanted to dig into that number a little bit because I think there's more to the story around email than just me quoting you some numbers. Um, so I'll show you some charts. And the first one that we're looking at here is the results of the Sh Marketing Sherpa survey over the different channels that they looked at. And we can see on the left-hand side, email being at 72%. But I think really two telling factors in here for me uh, was the next closest one, um, apart from it being postal mail, surprise uh, on my side of things, but it's more that that's at under 50%. So we're looking at a more than 20 a percentage point difference between email and its next closest channel. And as we go down in that stack of channels, uh, in the middle, we can see text messaging and social media, two very much more current, if you will, channels. And they're both under 20%. And even if we combine them together, they're going to be around about half or just over half of what email is. So in reflecting on the state of the nation, it's not just that email is something that folks want to engage with or feels a good way to be engaged with. Uh, it, it's today still pretty dominant over the other channels that we're looking at. And just to provide a, a little bit more context around that, and we might be able to say, well, that's great, Jeff. I'm glad that it's an important thing today. Where's that going to drive forward for us? And this slide here certainly supports the argument for the future being promising for email as well. Again, same sort of breakdown going across the different channels. Uh, we can see email on the left. And again, supporting the today side of things, the middle cohorts, the 35 to 44 and 45 to 54 uh, year old age groups are all up well over 70% and looking at email as being a good communication channel. Um, really the one that is of most interest from my perspective is this bar on the left hand side of email. This is for the youngest demographic, the 18 to 34 year olds. Um, they're still up just under 70%. Um, but where I see that as being encouraging for the future, these are our next generation of leaders. These are the people that are going to be coming into those positions over the next number of years. So they still have a very favorable position towards email. They certainly, as we look at it, have a very favorable impression towards social media as well. Um, but for us from the email side of things, it's suggesting that they'll carry that forward as they go into leadership positions. So what we're looking at today uh, isn't just a October 18th sort of view. It's we're going to be able to look at this for a number of years down the road. So to the question of, is email still relevant for us? These numbers would certainly suggest that it is. So going into really the heart of what we want to talk to here today about email reputation, and just to put the bold question out there, does email reputation impact your engagement? And the simple version of the answer is yes. And I'd say yes, absolutely. I've got an exclamation mark there to make it emphatic. Um, and some of the research that I turn to, I'm a big follower of Return Path. Um, so I brought up two points that they've done in their recent research uh, in the last, it was either earlier this year or very end of uh, December 2015. And what they're seeing is that low reputation means that your email doesn't get delivered. So in terms of those engagement metrics that we want to look at, this becomes a very binary sort of scenario. If we don't have a good email reputation, our messages aren't getting delivered, so we don't even really get to engagement metrics. They're just going to fall off for us because people aren't getting our message. And when we dig into that low reputation piece from Return Path a bit, they're showing that just about 25% of all email that's sent doesn't reach the intended inbox. Now that is across industry. Uh, that is across business to business and business to consumer side of things, but as sort of an average number for those different considerations, a quarter of all email sent doesn't get to the inbox. And really the telling part for me as part of what we want to look at here today is of those 25% that isn't getting into the inbox, 83% of that is related to poor email reputation. I just want to repeat that because when I read it, it sort of set me back in my heels. Um, and that's 83% of our undelivered messages aren't going through because of email reputation. And where that impacts even more, I believe, is that when we look at the amount of effort that we spend in creating our content and the authorship that we spend um, time and money on, um, getting our lawyers or professionals wrangled up to give us that content, our branding efforts, 
the design effort that we put in. If we were to say to you, okay, we're going to spend all of this and 20% of this isn't going to work simply because of outside factors, um, it certainly is a big number for us to be aware of. And that's the 20% I'm doing the 25% undelivered and 83% being reputation. So 20% of our effort that we're devoting to content and brand and that authorship that is so important to us on the content side of the house is going to be ineffective because of this thing called email reputation. So with that, I'd like to explore what is email reputation with you. So this is a sort of polygon of the different definitions that are out there. Um, tried to make it pretty coherent and, and sort of simple for what we want to look at here today. And that's email rep, and I'm read it off here for us. I know we can all read, but I think it's very worthwhile just hearing it read out. Email reputation is a scored rating that applies to email server sending email. That goes back to us again on the IT side of things, but from the marketing or business side, the big thing out of the email reputation is it's a score. It's something that we can get at. It's something that we can understand and do something with. There's a couple other things that I wanna tease out as part of what this reputation piece is. Um, and one of the big ones is going to be that this isn't something that we control. And as I've noted at the bottom of the definition, um, these scores are generated by a third party organization. So we'll have a look at that as we go through. But when we say email reputation, it is a score that's applied to our emails that we're sending. And when we talk about it being a score, that means somewhere someone's created a formula for this. Um, so it's important for us to have a look at what are those pieces that go into our email reputation. So I've listed them up here on the screen for us and I just wanna walk through those with you a bit um, and give you sort of some insights and, and look at what we're really talking to here. So one of the biggest impacts on our email reputation is going to be our number of bounce backs. Um, we'll have a look again at how we can uh, ameliorate that as we go along, but just that notion of bounce back is significant for us. And I always have a little bit of fun with bounce backs because when I was doing data management, uh, it was always that, very important thing to do and if we had a top 10 list it was always number 11. Um, but it does contribute very directly to our email reputation. Um, we also have the next two, the number of complaints and the number of spam reports that, that come in. Now these aren't people calling out to us or calling up the firm saying, hey, you keep sending me these messages, I don't want them anymore, or saying, hey, you're a spammer, I'm going to call castles or whatever uh, action they wanna take with it. Um, this is literally in all of the email platforms that are, are current today, you're going to have that ability to mark a message as spam or to report it as abuse. So if you go looking in Outlook or if you're in uh, Outlook uh, Web Access or Gmail, uh, they'll all have this ability to flag your email as either a complaint or a spam or both. Uh, and those are getting counted and being tracked for us. The fourth one, which is a very big one in the terms of the email reputation world, uh, is this wonderfully thing titled honeypots. Uh, honeypots are email traps. So what's done in the world of the internet is an email address will be identified as not working anymore. And if people keep sending to it, then it will be tracked and all of the senders that hit that email address will have an infraction against them in terms of their reputation. So it's a notion, for example, if Jeff Hemming um, at gmail.com was no longer being used and people kept sending to it, uh, it would be tracked. And every time that you get sent to it, it can downgrade your email reputation. And as I understand the algorithms that we've looked at, between the honeypot and the bounce back, those are two of the biggest factors for your email reputation and the score. Um, I've seen some accounts that have been written of where say you had a, a reasonably good score of 80, if you hit a couple of honeypots or had a fair number of bounce backs coming back into you um, or being recorded, uh, it can drop it down to a 70 or a 60, um, therefore taking you out of that sort of good category into a middling category, or if you started in a middling uh, score, um, assuming we're working out of 100, you can very much get down into the low scores and with those low scores, generally once you get into the 50 range, 60, 50 range, um, action will be taken and your emails can be stopped being sent. So some very significant factors we wanna look at here and be aware of. 
Uh, there's also some technical factors that go into how the score is set up. And by technical, um, referring here to literally the technical infrastructure that you're using. Uh, so this is some simple things. Are, is the email server set up properly? Is it properly identified on the network? Does it comply with some of the technical um, um, standards that are, have been defined and are being defined for uh, email and, and how it's going to work? So once we move beyond the measured side, great to know what the factors are that go into our reputation. How is this being used? Um, first and foremost, it's not something that we are directly using. It's being used by the internet service providers. Um, and what they're doing with it is they're taking that score and they're using it as a proxy to determine, is this a valid email? Is this something that we want to forward on to the ultimate end recipient? So that's where we talk to here in the second point. Um, it's their best attempt to say, at least today, is this a good email? They'll have thresholds depending on what their particular uh, view to how they want to work with the email scores are and the reputation of the people providing those scores. And if your email meets their threshold, it will go on or it can do some other things with it. It's not going to be a black and white if you're below the threshold that you automatically get blocked. It's a bit of a sliding scale. Um, but as I've alluded to, you can get a low enough score uh, that will block your message from being sent, um, putting you into that blacklisted category that, that we're all seeking to avoid. So I've talked a bit about what is this score, why we want to pay attention to it. Um, you're probably asking the question of, great, Jeff, that's interesting stuff to know. Well, how do I get access to that? It's not something that I'm working with. Um, and what I have here on the screen are the, some of the key or the main providers of what your reputational scores are going to be. Um, the big thing out of here before I talk to some of these is that they are third parties. They're not affiliated with your service provider. Um, they're not somebody that you can walk down the hall and say, hey, Jeff, or hey, hey Sally, we need to talk about reputation. Um, they are third party companies that exist in this world uh, for the sole purpose of making sure your reputation is tracked. And they really provide the service to the ISPs so that the ISPs can use it uh, in determining is this good email or is this not good email. In terms of the ones that are listed up here, there's actually two or three times this number of organizations that will provide uh, along the, the range of what scores are. Um, I've selected these based on sort of the ones that everyone goes to and looking at the research, the most common ones, basically. Um, I've already mentioned return path is something that we go to uh, at Ticket and we use. Uh, Marketing Sherpa is certainly one that I've used for some of the stats that we're looking at today. Uh, I would, in my books, I would say those are the two premier ones, uh, but certainly Senderbase uh, is right up there. And then the DYN and MBOX, pardon me, MX Toolbox provide not only the reputational scores, but some other things that can help you in managing your email and how it's set up. But again, the big piece out of here when we're talking about our reputation is that it's established by someone independent from our company. And that leads me to this slide that we have where it's, we are not in control of this reputation. And I don't know where you all will all sit on this curve, but certainly as a marketer and all the effort we spend trying to control our message, uh, this scares not quite the living out of me, but certainly does put a deep fear in me because this is something that other people are judging us on. And if we're not aware of it, it's happening in the background and we're just not even uh, aware that it's going. So that ability to make sure my message is as good as it can be and get into the inbox um, is slipping away and, and, and not being as effective as it can be. So making good progress through our slides here, so what do we need to do about this? Or what can we do about our email reputation? Hopefully I haven't painted too dark or gloomy of a picture for us uh, because there's certainly things that we can look at with this. Um, one of the first things is that we wanna know and monitor our email reputation. So we've suggested on the previous slide here uh, where we can go to get that reputation. Most of the services that are out there will offer you some sort of um, free, this is what your reputation is at a high level. And then if you want to dive down into it, some will allow you to dig deeper. Uh, some, pardon me, will offer a paid service that can help you understand 
and influence your email uh, reputation. But the big thing, and what I would offer you is the starting point for what you want to do with your email reputation, um, is to find out what it is and then keep an eye on it. Because it's not something that's static. It will go up and down depending on what you're sending, when you're sending it, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a dynamic piece that can change over time. And part of why I recommend or uh, bring it up, good to know that it's dynamic, but if you get your email reputation and it comes back good, say you were getting an 85 or a 90 um, based on what you're doing uh, with Return Path, for example, that's awesome. Th those are very good scores and, and certainly where you want to maintain it. But if you were to do a send and hit a number of those honeypots or email traps that I had mentioned previously, um, they can hit the score quite hard. Uh, and there's been some examples where they can go down by as much as uh, 15, 20, or 25 points on the scoring scale. So if you were starting at an 85, for example, you could get down into a middling score of a 65 uh, very quickly if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. Or if you were starting in a middling position, you could find yourself um, in much deeper trouble in that you're, if not blacklisted, very close to being blacklisted. So starting point to this is know and monitor what your email reputation is. Um, for me, one of the big ones and, and recommendations when we talk to clients is uh, deal with your bounce backs. Uh, it, it's um, quite common when we talk with firms, well, they'll have inboxes with many thousands of email addresses in there that have bounced back, uh, and they're just not getting to them. Um, the bounce back is big force in two uh, uh, aspects. One, that notion of just dealing with them, meaning at the very least, don't send to those people that have bounced. That'll reduce your bounce back count, which will have a good uh, impact on your reputation. Uh, the other one is that notion of the honeypot or that email trap. Um, by taking off those returned addresses when they come back in, uh, you reduce the likelihood or the possibility of hitting those email traps. So further reducing uh, the risk to your email reputation and you know, ultimately enhancing it. Um, another big thing that we want to look at in terms of our email reputation, and this will also go directly to our engagement side of things, um, is give your contacts what they're interested in. It's a, a plain version or a plain language version of saying, uh, use only opted in lists. Uh, this really comes back to email best practice and we've certainly heard a lot of it over the last few years uh, in a lot of different guises, but it, it really is if you're not doing opted in lists or you're having challenges with it, uh, something that you wanna go down the path of. And when we talk about opted in lists, there's certainly that gold standard of having the mechanisms in your email to say, hey, this is what we're offering, are you interested in it or not, and, and letting your contacts pick and choose what's there. But it also goes beyond that um, um, ability to pick and choose. For example, if you have lateral hires coming in or new hires coming in, um, you wanna take a look at what their lists are and go through a vetting process to get them to an opted in um, standard, if you will. It's quite likely, you know, Jeff's been working in the email space for the last 15 years, He's got a lot of people that he's come into contact with. Uh, some of those we definitely want to have um, uh, on the firm list and being able to communicate with and getting them opted in. But there's also people that Jeff knew when he first started out in the space um, that may or may not be wanting to opt in or, or good candidates even to uh, receive the type of communications that we're doing. And another piece around the, the notion of the list is uh, purchase list. Um, for those that use purchase lists, the, the current best practice is not to. Uh, there are some very sort of narrow ranges where it can be good, but generally we want to be um, very, very specific with our purchase list, making sure if we do use them, that we have a very, very strong sense of what the quality of those lists are. And that's really, it, it is a knock against purchase lists. There's a lot of very low quality or even middle, middling quali quality lists available to us. Um, and our challenge is going to be if we use those middle to low quality lists, um, that it will damage our email reputation and it's not going to impact just that one or two cents that we use it for. It can have a carryover effect if we're not paying attention and making sure that our reputation is as good as it can be. Um, and the last point in here, I'm just going to grab a quick drink here, is something that I saw from the... Um, sender path uh, reading that I was doing. I thought this was a very interesting point for us to raise. 
and certainly is a talking point in the world of law. And that's the notion of sending our email messages at consistent times and with consistent volumes. Um, the idea to it here is if we're just sporadically sending emails, uh, that can have an impact, uh, as, as well as we're seeing, you know, not are we going with a 100-person list or a 200-person list, but if we're doing, you know, in a given week, 10,000 messages one week and 100,000 messages the next week and 50,000 the week after, et cetera, we're getting fairly substantial swings in the volumes that we're looking at. Um, those can have an impact. So what we want to look at is almost like a sending schedule with your email. So we'll say, you know, alerts, well, in the fly in the ointment to all of this when we're talking about legal marketing are alerts. Uh, when they have to go, they have to go. Um, generally, they should be lower volume things, so they should have a moderating impact on what we're doing. Um, if not, we do want to have some conversation around, well, is it, you know, if we're doing an alert about capital markets out to 30,000 people, and it's just happening willy-nilly, is there a possibility of putting a schedule around that? And certainly things like our invitations that we do, things like we do with our newsletters or, or um, dynamic content feeds where we're doing updates, those are all open to being scheduled. Um, but it's, it's to have that internal conversation around what does our sending pattern look like? What does our sending volume look like? And what can we do? You know, it may be consistent already, in which case, great. If it's not, then you can have that conversation and say, um, what can we do to make that better? And I've got through this pretty quickly. We, we get to the final screen here. Um, so some final thoughts too, as we go through and think about email reputation in terms of engagement and my starting uh, sort of poke comment of is content dead? So email reputation is very much a key factor in our engagement. For the simple fact of if we don't get it right, then we won't be engaging. Um, the poorer our reputation, the less of our content that gets through, the less of our content that gets through, the less engagement we're going to have. And then our click-throughs, our opens, our forwards, our shares, and all of that good stuff that we're looking for uh, falls away for us. So it, it's that sort of, if you will, email reputation is what engagement stands on. Uh, so we want to make sure we have as high a reputation as we can for it. Um, the good news out of this notion with email reputation uh, and it being a key factor for us in our engagement, um, it, is, it is something that you can directly influence. Even though you don't control it and there are third party uh, companies that exist somewhere out there in the ether, um, they're not meant to be there as punitive to you. They're meant to be there to keep you honest, if you will. Um, so what you want to do is understand those factors that we talked or I mentioned a little bit earlier and be able to say, okay, this is where we're breaking down. This is where my reputation is. Um, what steps can I take and put a, if you do have a, a low or, or um, less than good email reputation, what are the steps that we're going to take to improve that? And then it becomes like any other campaign or, or sort of strategic priority we have within the organization we keep working that and over time you will influence your score and increase it into those you know the upper realms of what the numbers are uh, so that your messages are getting through and then as sort of falls out from this uh, it does take time to do this it's one email if it's a really bad email can have an impact but we generally see these things sort of going up and down on sort of a slow uh, slow on a wave sort of pattern so if you have bad practices, it will keep going down. If you improve your practices, it will start going up. So because it takes that time, um, we want to start with it as soon as you can. In my small world, I would say you want to start up this today with something very simple as going and checking out what your email reputation score is. And then most importantly, and back to the, the very first uh, slide in the title, a um, bit tongue in cheek, but a very real element to this, your email reputation is, in some cases, more important than your content. Uh, that's a really big thing to say because of all the effort, and as marketers especially, we're very focused on content. Um, but we can have the best written stuff in the world. We can have the greatest brand that's ever been created in the world. We can have the ultimate layout. But if we don't have a good reputation, all of that is just hitting you know, the walls, if you will, or the doorways into firms and falling as debris outside the four walls of the firm and isn't getting to 
our contacts or getting to the people that we need to reach um, because they've told us they want to get to it. So is content dead? It never will be dead, but it does have some pretty powerful foes if we don't pay attention to them, one of which is going to be email reputation. And with that, I am done on the speaking side of things. Um, so I'll open this up certainly for conversation or, or questions. And um, otherwise, we'll return some time in your day. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff, for the great presentation. Um, okay, folks, remember, please utilize the Q&A box for your comments or questions. While we're waiting final questions, I'd like to mention a link to the recording of the webinar will be posted on our website in a few days. Shortly after today's webinar, you'll receive a survey in the um, email. We ask that you take a few minutes to complete. This helps us determine the type of programming that you would like to see. So, okay, Jeff, we have a couple questions, and I think they kind of play on each other. So, uh, okay. how are bounce backs measured? Total bounces, repeat bounces to the same address or some combination? Um, it, it's going to be some combination, and it really breaks down across the notion of bounce back in the email traps. Um, so ultimately, it's on the pure bounce back side, it's a total number of bounce backs. So if you send to a list of 500 people and you get 400 bounce backs as a result of that, um, then that's the number that's going to get, be used for it. Um, the email trap side of things or the honeypot trap side of things is going to be every time you hit that address. So again, if jeff.hemming at gmail.com was um, identified by the service providers that you're using as an email trap, every time you hit that, it will be recorded against the firm. So if you send it once to Jeff, not the end of the world, but if you send it 100 times to the Gmail address, that's definitely going to have an impact for you. Okay, then the other question I have is blocked from being sent or blocked from being delivered? Well, it depends would be the, the, um, the answer for that. What it does is that if you have a large number of bounce backs or if you're hitting these email traps, it goes to your score. So if you're starting with a very good score and you're just having a, for whatever reason, you've used a really bad list that has a lot of bounce backs and a lot of uh, email traps in it, it may take your score from an 85, for example, and most of the scoring services score things out of 100. Right? It's the way we started in school, so it's the way we, we look at the world, everything out of 100. So if you had a good score of 85, and you had a number of infractions, um, again, those email traps and the bounce backs, it may take a 20 point hit and go down to a 65. So at that point, it becomes what are the internet service providers thresholds, if they say, well, at 65, we'll let it go, but we'll monitor it, it will go through. If they say, no, 65 isn't legitimate enough for us or a good enough score for us, they may block it. So meaning that once it gets to that stage of being blocked, you'll send it, you know, it'll come off of your email server saying, great, um, it just won't arrive in the destination. Uh, and I'm not aware of at the moment if there's any well, I suppose from return path or sender score, they'll have ways of tracking that and that's what you would pay them for is to get that information. Um, but generally, there isn't a specific report you can go and say, hey, these ones uh, were bounced um, directly. Did I answer that, Gail, or just sort of um, throw a bit of information out there? I, I, that's good for me. I do have another question. Does sure. content flagged as spam affect reputation scores, i.e. keywords, images, without text? Um, that's a good question, and I, I didn't get a definitive answer on when we say flagged as spam. So if it goes through to the recipient side and the recipient side says this is spam, I didn't get a clear answer if that would be counted or not. What does get counted as spam is if somebody's reading the email, and they go into their email tool and say, mark this as spam, or mark, there's, there's menu options that say mark as spam or mark as abuse. That stuff is definitely counted and it's an aggregate score by mailing and the number of mailings that you do. So if you send one mailing to 500 people and get 10 spam scores or 10 flag to spam using that menu on the receiving side um, or abuse and they aggregate that. And the more that you do in relation to the volume that you're sending, um, is, is where it starts to impact the score. 
Okay, um, I think that is it for questions. So, um, once again, thank you, Jeff and Ticket, for sponsoring the web webinar and for all of you for attending. So, uh, keep an eye on our website for future webinars. Everyone have a great day and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks very much, Gil. Take care, Thanks. all.